Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, I'm going to try to liven it up because you guys are all sad sacks today. Okay. Stop being a sad sack. <laughs> I'm not sad. Okay, any any questions or comments on uh, anything that we've uh, looked at just recently? I had a, a question. In Jeremiah 22... There's a couple of verses, and then it's towards the end of the chapter where it references a couple of times where people are hurled here and there. And I was just wondering if that was a reference to them being poofed here and there. No, probably not poofed, probably just thrown. What, Jeremiah 22 what? Towards the end of the, the um, chapter. I'm sorry, I don't have things set up tonight. 26. I will hurl you and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born. That's an interesting set of words. Let me, give me just a second and let me load up my, my Hebrew Bible so I can look at what word that is. Hurl. Oh, interesting. I don't know that I noticed that when we were going through it, that that word was used. Sorry, I should have had my computer Bible loaded. I, I had to reboot just before we started. My computer decided it didn't want to compute for a while. <laughs> What was that passage again? Jeremiah, Jeremiah twenty two twenty six. Okay, I got twenty two. Okay, thank it you. Meant it, it mentions it in another verse too. I'm trying yeah. to find it. Oh, well, yep. Well, it, it means to be thrown far. It mean, I mean, it's a good translation. It's the uh, the Hebrew verb kataliti, which is a strange word form, but <laughs> but I'm not seeing it all of a sudden in the. I'm seeing it only in the transliteration, not in the actual Hebrew. So let me let me look again. See that that's not an implied word. I have the Strong's for it. It is what? Uh, numbers twenty nine oh four, a primitive root to pitch over or reel, hence transitively to cast down or out. Carry away utterly, cast down, forth, or out, send out. Yeah, it's translated as cast nine times. Um, that's interesting. Cast nine times, cast three times, carry away once, and send out once. So it means exactly what it says, or what we would think of mm -hmm. as hurl. Um, so that your question is an interesting one. Is that a is that a uh, an item of poofology? Um, I would have to do a lot more research to. I don't think so, but I, I think just remove them from the scene is what uh, is being said. I'm gonna. I'm going to write that down to do some more on that. That's kind of an interesting phrase. And I, I, as many times as I've read Jeremiah, I didn't pick up on it. And I thought I heard it twice in the passage, but now I can't find it. Hmm. 
Let's see if any any commentators say anything special on it. It is twice. It's in verse 25 also. Yeah, the handbook on Jeremiah says hurl is the same verb as used in 1613, which is therefore I'll hurl you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your fathers have known. You shall serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. The uh, Today's English version understands hurl into another country as force you into exile, which makes sense. Yeah, and if if um if it's in verse 25 also the nasb says and i shall give you over into the hands of those who are seeking your life which was one of the translations right. one of the alternate translations so yeah and that same word is used in second kings 24 15 jeremiah 10 18 and jeremiah 16 13. Okay. So I, I would just from the surface say no, it's probably not a poof. More, more like God's going to force the issue and He's going to remove them because they don't want to go. Mm -hmm. But hurl certainly is more dramatic. I'm going to exile you, or I'm going to hurl you. Yeah, I'm more afraid if God tells me He's going to hurl me. <laughs> yeah. And I don't ever remember hearing the word hurl used in mm -hmm. the Bible language before, and it just seemed like an odd word to use. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm surprised that that uh, that we've not seen that before. Mm -hmm. Just just proves that you can go through this several times and pick up new stuff all the time. Sandy's coming back. Yeah. I, I didn't realize we lost her. Okay. <coughs> Hi, Sandy, if you're back. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's in verse 28, too. Why are he and his children hurled and cast into a land that they do not know? Because I didn't have it in 25, but it's in 28. Yeah, I see it in 28. Yeah, hurled, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's going to throw them out, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what they did, what he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and to the Israelite, that was a big deal because their whole relationship with God was tied to that piece of dirt. Mm -hmm. So when God says, I'm going to remove you from that piece of dirt, that was a big deal. Yeah, 16.13 explains it pretty well, too. He says, throw you out, but it's still the same. Like same what word, you yeah. Just said, yeah. Into another land where you don't know anything. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, other questions, comments? Okay. Okay, let's go on to chapter 25. Of Ezekiel, we're we're making pretty good uh, progress. I noticed this afternoon while I was uh, getting my uh, my slides together and everything that in my notes I missed chapter twenty eight. Bridge, did we yes. finish chapter twenty four? I thought we stopped at the end of verse eighteen. I have in my notes that we stopped at the end of verse twenty four. Yeah, yeah, we, we did. We did. Okay. And I, I looked at the video. I often have to look at the video because I forget to write down where I stopped. And I went back and looked mm -hmm. at the video, and that's where that's what I had on the screen was uh, was the last few verses of twenty four or last few uh, words words of twenty four. Yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, okay. I just slept through the last half. I was here last week, <laughs> yeah. wasn't I? <laughs> yeah. Were you? I don't know. Yeah, I've got I got twenty five one. one. And my brain has been broken. Chuck's always accusing me of putting him to sleep, so maybe it, maybe other people get to sleep too. No, 
No, I enjoy coming. I just lost my brain, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I've been saying that for 60 plus years, so. Yeah, I know. Okay, we're on to chapter 25. Yeah. Every knee shall bow is the section that we're in that will be in for a few chapters here. Judgment was coming to those nations who rejoiced at the destruction of Jerusalem, Judah, and previously Israel. You can imagine what it was like for, for Israel, who always had this, we're just a little bit better than you persona. Because God insisted on the idea of, of the separation of clean and unclean. And you're not God's chosen people, so you're, you're automatically unclean and so forth. They had this, this air about them that they were just a little bit... Um, okay, Sandy, thanks. Uh, I, I see your chat now. I'm sorry, I missed it earlier <laughs> for your chat that you had to do the update. They always come at the wrong time. Um, Israel had this, this, this misconception that they were better than everybody else because of God's teaching of clean and unclean. Um, I wonder how that will be displayed when we get to the Millennial Kingdom, when Israel will be at the very least the first among equals. You know, I think, I, I think, I can't prove this yet, but I think Israel will be on a different plane than the rest of us, uh, than the rest of the, of the of the still natural world then, I shouldn't say the rest of us, um, because they will be, David will be on the throne of Israel, Jesus will be on the throne of the world, um, and, and they will have a, a little bit different relationship with Jesus. And so it'll be, at, at very least, I, I look at them as, as being the first among e equals. And so I, I wonder how that plays out for the thousand years. It didn't play out well when when they were surrounded by all these nations, that they said, well, we're just a little bit better than you. So you can imagine when, when Israel falls and the nations around are rejoicing, that Israel's pretty frustrated at that. The same thing with, with uh, Jerusalem and uh, Judah. When, when, uh, when they begin to, to be oppressed by Nebuchadnezzar, there's a lot of rejoicing going on by all those nations, particularly the nations that are kind of related to Israel, you know, first cousins, second cousins, whatever, and are uh, uh, people that Israel had conquered. Remember, most of that region, if we go back to uh, if we go back to this map here, let me make this full screen for you. Make it easier for you. We go back to that map. Most of that area, the red area, um, was conquered under David and Solomon. So all the nations that that hive themselves out of what David and Solomon had, um, now that Israel and and Judah are falling, or have fallen, they're pretty rejoiceful. They're pretty happy at what's going on. You're finally going to get yours. And, and so there's, there's a lot of rejoicing in the Levant, in the neighborhood. And uh, that's going to cause problems for them in the, uh, in the future. Many of these foreign nations had been attacked, as I just said. These nations now looked at the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem with joy and with glee. That's never a good thing. Oh, well, my whole my whole um, scope of of uh, where you all are positioned on my screen just got jumbled up. Wow. <laughs> you got shuffled. Yeah, you guys are messing with my head. Don't do that. I'm fragile. We got shuffled. <laughs> yeah, you got shuffled. Got on my screen. Yeah, it's all weird. Linda's always in the upper left hand corner. Now she's yeah. down in the lower right. She's back with Sandy now. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> Weird. Has okay. a bit on my screen. The, yeah. the people of Israel had entered into a covenant, covenant as we know, with God that, that held those people to a 
particular um, response in a particular situation. They couldn't worship idols and so forth. Of course, we know they violated that. And so what did God do? He did what he was obligated to do, what he said he would do if they acted like that. And he said he would, as we learned tonight from Jeremiah, he was going to hurl them out of the country. So Israel soon turned from following God and began to worship the false idols. And God said, fine. After 1,400 years, it's over. And out you go. God was punishing Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem. What the nations around Israel didn't realize in their glee at the punishment of Jerusalem was there's coming punishment for them as well. Even Nebuchadnezzar. I, I love the picture of Nebuchadnezzar as he, as he joyfully conquers Judah and Jerusalem and is all even arrogant about what he did. God said, even though God put him up to that, God said, you're going to pay a price for that as well. And so he, and he did. We can go to Proverbs... Uh-oh. Where did my Proverbs passage go? Well, anyway, I'll read it to you. If the righteous is repaid on the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. So, when you read this proverb, you gotta you got to take a little bit of maybe literal license here and ask the question, what does God mean when he says the righteous? Since it's the Old Testament, it would mean people that belong to God bringing it into the New Testament. It would be believers. So, you're saying Israel. Israel or Israel and his proselytes. Okay, that's a good answer, and his proselytes. I like that. God was punishing... I, I think we have to use in, in Proverbs, because of the context and the genre, we have to use righteous in a little bit more forgiving way and extend it to all of Israel and all those that, that wanted to be part of Israel. So the way Mary said it, the, the Israelites and their proselytes is a pretty good way to view that. It is not specifically the followers of God. In, in the New Testament, the righteous would be a reference to us um, believers. But I think in, in Proverbs, we have to use just a little bit of looser language because of the genre and say this is a reference to Israel. And that fits with what we're talking about. The, if, if God is going to punish his chosen people, how much more will he punish those that went after his chosen people. That's the point of this proverb. Israel should recognize that God was punishing his own people, but he's also going to punish those that went after him. The section of, that we're moving into of Ezekiel deals with the coming punishment of the nations around Israel. All of those that were at this point, when Nebuchadnezzar is taking over Judah, when he's building his siege ramps up the up the walls, the rest of the world is watching news at 11, and they're going, yeah, that's finally, 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 Jerusalem's going to fall. They're happy about it. And God says, not so fast. Hang on. So let's move on then. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Oops, too far. <laughs> Ezekiel is again addressed as the Son of Man 90, 90 some times in the book. God directs Ezekiel to set his face against the Ammonites. The Ammonites are, were the people of Ammon, a territory east of the Jordan River. It's roughly equivalent, roughly equivalent to the modern uh, state, uh, the Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan. That's the, that's the technical name for Jordan, by the way. The Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan. 
Um, the Ammonites were, uh, they traced their history back to, uh, to the offspring of Lot's younger daughter, Genesis 19. Um, Israel and, and Ammon had been enemies um, often and continuously. Israel occupied much of the uh, territory of the Ammonites under uh, David and Solomon. And so there, there wasn't a lot of love loss there. Um, despite being a cousin, second cousin, whatever, to uh, Israel, they didn't like each other. And so there was a lot of hostility. Um, Ammon was, the Ammonites were one of those people that, that would take from, uh, from Judah whenever, whenever they could. Um, we saw some reference to that during the judges. We see, uh, we see often during, uh, during the divided monarchy, kings going to battle with the Ammonites. So there was, there was really no, no good relationship there. The phrase, set your face, is an ancient Near East saying that implies focus upon a particular object or a location. In other words, God was directing e Ezekiel in this part of the prophecy to focus on Ammon. Focus on the Ammonites and tell them this is what I said. God was preparing Ezekiel for what would come. And what would what comes is say to the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, Because you have said ah over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and over the house of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you, and make their dwellings in your midst, and they shall eat your fruit, and they shall drink your milk. I will make Rab, uh, I will make Rabbah a pasture for camels, and Ammon for a full uh, a fold for flocks. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Because the, the Ammonites rejoiced over the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the removal of, of Jews from the land, they themselves would be handed op over to another people group. The nation of Ammon would be turned uh, over to people from further east. Who's that? Who's further east than, Ammon, than uh, Jordan? The Muslims? Iran, Iraq? Well, not, not then. This is... This is 1,200 years before Islam. Islam comes about in 600 A.D. Maybe even the late 600 A.D. Say that again? Russia? Persia? Persia? And, and who, who, who were the Persians? Cat. Who are the were Persians? Those descendants of Esau? No, we're talking about we're talking talking about Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Oh, okay. Where 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 are the Babylonians? They're in modern day Iraq and Iran, and uh, that's east of Jordan. So as you you would think it would be easy that that uh, the Babylonians would just go west, but they had to go north in through Assyria. Because there was a large area of desert there that was very difficult to cross. So they would go up the Euphrates. Let me, let me give you the map again. That'll mm -hmm. make it a little easier. Yeah. That's what Abraham had to do. That's right. That's exactly right. So Mesopotamia, you see on the, uh, on the picture, Mesopotamia is Iraq mm -hmm. and Iran and... Uh, um, was was Babylon, and they would go up the Euphrates River. That's the river to the west, and then they would come down uh, into uh, into Israel, into uh, Jordan, and so forth. The uh, uh, Jordan is immediately east of Israel, so it's between Babylon and Israel. But they had to, they went through Israel to get to Jordan because. Of the desert buffer, and it was very difficult to cross. So we we can we can go forward 
600 years to the birth of Jesus and the coming of the Magi. The Magi came from Babylon. But it took them a long time to get there because they didn't just go west. They had to go north and then come south. So, Ammon would be turned over to the people further east. The Ammonites were nomadic people, but they had a couple of big cities, but their land would be turned into grazing area for herds. God intended to reflect the authority he holds over all nations. Even though he was the God of Israel, he was going to show the Ammonites, I'm also the God of the universe. And you just don't get to do that to my people. He wanted those nations to know that he alone was the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel, therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as plunder to the nations. And I will cut you off from the peoples and will make you perish out of the countries. And I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. God further says that because they rejoiced at Israel's fall, God will hand over the Ammonites as plunder, as the, as the, 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 the goods that are re received because of war to other nations. There's a couple of significant truths we see in this exchange. God clearly is reminding both the people of Israel and the Gentiles around them that he is sovereign. And as sovereign, he alone, he alone determines their fate. That's a lesson we need to learn today. Because that same part of the world is on fire today. And God is still sovereign over that piece of dirt. God's clearly reminding the people who he is and the power he holds. The Gentile nations, including the Ammonites, um, celebrated with the Babylonians conquering Judah and Jerusalem. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar just kept on going east after he took J Jerusalem and he took them on next. We also need to see that God's punishment always comes even if it's delayed from our perspective. God always punishes. It's just sometimes delayed from our perspective. Always at the appropriate time for God's plan. You know, I've been working on, on my study of the conflict in God, and I was doing some reading yesterday on the decree of God. Some scholars hold that God has many decrees. I would argue God has one decree. That one decree set everything in motion and continuously cares for everything that goes on. And if God only had one decree, then in that decree, he has established what will happen to every body and every nation. That to me is a remarkable, remarkable thing and speaks to how significant, how majestic God is. I mean, I can make a plan that doesn't stand a chance of lasting five minutes. God made a plan that's lasted so far for eternity. And that to me is just, just remarkable. So, I, I say all of that to remind us that God's punishment comes. If we're, not, if we're not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, punishment will be sure, and it will be clear. And we will ultimately know, just like it says at the end of verse uh, 7, then you will know that I am the Lord. That is God's, that's God's default 
for what needs to be learned in punishment. But he's the Lord. And that's kind of kind of remarkable to me, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. Any questions, comments? Clear. Thus says the Lord God, verse 8, Because Moab and Seir said, Behold, the house of Judah is like the other nations. Therefore I will lay open the flank of Moab from the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beth uh, Jesh Jeshemoth, ba Baal Meon, and Carathiam. Where's Brian when you need him? I will... <laughs> I will give it along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession, that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations. And I will execute judgments upon Moab, then they will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel quotes God this time speaking against Moab and Seir. Moab lay directly south of the Ammonites on the east side of the Dead Sea. The king's highway from south east and north, passed through the eastern edge of Moab. The Moabites were descendants of Moab, the son of Lot and his oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. Despite the relationship of Moab to Israel, there was almost always, almost always, a state of war between Israel mm -hmm. and Moab. The Moabites did not rejoice over the fall of Israel as, as uh, the Ammonites did, but they still believe that Judah was just like any other nation. And Judah wasn't like any other nation. Judah was God's chosen people. The fact that Moab viewed Israel as simply as any other country reveals that the Moabites did not understand the position that Israel and Judah had in God's plan. I would submit that most Christians don't understand Israel's position in God's plan. Because, I, I, maybe I ought to rephrase that, most Western Christians don't understand it, because we have a completely different mindset than the ancient Near East uh, Israelite did. Our, our relationship with God is not tied to a piece of dirt. I'm glad that it's not. But we're not tribal in origin, uh, at least not in, in for a long time. We've lost all of our tribal mentality, although it seems like it seems to be coming back. Mm -hmm. We don't understand the collective relationship that Israel Judah had with God. Because for us, relationship with God is, is a primarily individual thing, the closest thing we have to a collective relationship is the church. And for most Christians, the church is not important enough to be part of their necessarily part of their relationship with God, if that makes sense. And that's a frustration. Because for many, church is just what you do when you don't have something else to do. Whereas for Israel, that, that was never the situation for them. They always knew they were tied to that land in a relationship with God. They just chose to ignore that. And so it's hard for us to comprehend what's being said here. The, the fact that Moab viewed Israel as simply as any other country reveals that that. I think, to me, it reveals that they're a little bit jealous. That they didn't have that relationship. They came from the same stock, but they they wandered away and, and they didn't have that relationship. And that was a frustration to them. But as a result, God added Moab to the list of Gentile nations that would be punished by him. Seir was a mountain range south of the Dead Sea. The nation of Edom lies within the mountain range of Seir, by the time Ezekiel is writing this, Seir had become synonymous with Edom. It's like this it's like the United States or America. They're they're basically synonymous. And Seir, the mountain range of Seir, was synonymous with, with Edom. 
Edom was included in this punishment announcement with Moab because they both didn't understand the true importance of who Israel was to God. Did, did, did Edom come from Esau? Yes. Okay. So we're talking about people all around Israel that are blood relatives, but who hated Israel. I, to me, it's fat. Anti-Semitism is a fascinating thing. I, I, the the combination of of psychology and sociology of why does the world hate Israel? It doesn't make good logical sense, but it's been true since Jacob and Esau. It makes sense why Esau didn't like Jacob. That makes perfect sense. But why several hundred uh, generations after does it still make sense? I can't comprehend that. Because they're carrying on a few. I see. Go ahead, Sybil. I think maybe because maybe they're jealous because they're the apple of God's eyes. Israel is, and they are not. And, yeah. and they hate them because Satan hates them. Because they're God's people. Yeah, I think that's probably the, the bigger part of the answer, that Satan is behind all of this. Why do we have so much anti-Semitism again? All of a sudden it has sprung up worldwide. Right. To me, that's phenomenal. I thought we had conquered that. Well, if, if, you, look at, if you look at history, you see waves of anti-Semitism all the way back to Jacob and Esau. There will be periods of time where, where the Jews are sought after. And, and to be quite frank, they get used by people and then they're discarded. And so you have these waves of anti-Semitism. And uh, I, I agree with you. We're in, we're in another really heavy wave. But I think this time, anti-Semitism is going to be linked with anti-Christian as well. And I think the world will be on a pro-Muslim movement very soon. And I don't know if you you were around Sybil when I uh, when I first broached this subject, but I think the the world religion of the Antichrist is Islam. Oh, well, that's what James said. He that's he said because we Christians are so stupid. And we bow down before everyone, especially the Muslims. Yep. The Muslims will never, ever, ever bow down before anyone but Islam. Right. You you can That's find exactly the, what he said. You can find being taught in public schools now how to uh, to pray Quranic prayers and so forth, but. You just say in Jesus' name in a public school and you're kicked out. Um, it, it, it's remarkable what's happening as the world is embracing Islam. When, when I was in elementary school, of course I grew up a Lutheran, and there were only Lutheran Catholics. And the Catholics were our enemies. And now the German Chancellor said, Islam is a big part of Germany. Right. Really? Really? Right. When we didn't even tolerate the Catholics in the land of the <laughs> Reformation. Yep. So it's, I, I think it is the one world religion. I think we're going to see more anti-Semitism and anti-Christian um, continue and a movement by the world to wholly embrace Islam. And and that that just tells me we're getting closer and closer and closer to the uh, to the oh, the so end good. times, yeah. So because Moab treated Judah as any other as as any other nation and didn't hold them in a position they really were the position they really were to God, God removed their glory. The glory of Moab was the cities of the northern area. God exposed the northern cities and made the northern area of Moab vulnerable to attack. 
God destroyed these cities. Uh, Cherethmoth, Je yeah, that one. Beit Meon <laughs> and Carathiam. All Moabite northern cities were destroyed. So it didn't take long for uh, Nebuchadnezzar's forces to just waltz in and, and take them out. The eastern tribes overran Ammon, now Moab. And again, this was so the people would know that God is sovereign. Thus says the Lord God, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast. And I'll make it desolate from Timon even to Dedan. They shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by, by the, the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. And they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord. In the previous passage, we saw mention of Seir lumped together with Moab because they viewed Israel and Judah in the same way. We saw the punishment for Moab and now for Edom, referred to as Seir in the previous passage. Because of Edom aided Babylon in their fight against Judah, in effect revenge against Judah, God pronounced judgment against Edom. Edom was taken over. Some of the lands of, uh, uh, of Edom had fallen, uh, of the fallen nations around... Let me say that again. Edom had taken over some of the lands of the fallen nations around her. When Judah was in battle with Ab uh, Babylon, Edom came up from the south to occupy southern Judah. God did not and would not let that stand. All of Edom's territory would lay desolate. Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice, of soul to destroy a never-ending enmity. I can't talk tonight. <laughs> Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Cherethites and destroy the rest of the seacoast. I will execute a great vengeance of them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. To the west of Judah lays the nations of, nation of the Philistines along what is today referred to as the Gaza Strip. The Philistines had been an en enemy of Israel since the earliest days of the conquest of Canaan by Israel. Many scholars believe that had Israel destroyed the small groups of Philistines early in the conquest, they would have never been a problem for Israel. It's, it's a fascinating study to look at where people groups come from. The Philistines are not indigenous to that part of the world. The Philistines come from the Greek islands. And about the time Joshua was leading in the conquest of Israel, this group, this small group of Greeks, of course they weren't called Greeks then, but this from the Greek islands, lands in the Gaza Strip and sets up shop. They become known as the Philistines. When Joshua conquered the promised land, had he just continued to do what God said and took them all out, they were so small, they would have never been a problem for David and for Solomon and for the nation of Israel after that. But because, again, Israel didn't do what God said and destroy them all, they were a thorn in Israel's side almost its entire existence. Because the Philistines had attempted to destroy Judah, God would destroy Philistia. The word Cherethites was a synonym for the Philistines. 1 Samuel 30 and Zephaniah 2, the word indicates the origin of the Philistines, which was the Greek islands, including Crete. During the intertestamental period, the period of time from the last writing prophets after the Babylonian captivity to the events in the New Testament, the Philistines kind of just vanished. There's lots of theories of what happened to them, but it was during that period of time that they basically ceased to exist. There's a, there's a group of, of people today that want the Philistines to be the uh, Palestinians, 
Not even close. Because they're, 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 they're from Jordan, a lot of them, aren't they? Yeah, Palestinians are from Egypt, Jordan, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're nomads that really had no land. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. Don't let the world fool you. There's no Palestinians. There never was a Palestine. Palestine was actually a derogative <laughs> term used of, of the land on Roman maps. It never was meant to be a people group. But sometime during the intertestamental period, the Philistines went away. We don't really know what happened to them. It's a fascinating look down history to try to determine what happened to them. They just kind of evaporated. God, Obviously God's punishment uh, became effective on them, but they just ceased to exist. <laughs> So that's chapter 25. I'm going to end there because it's it's after 8. Holy cow. <laughs> Questions, comments? No. Anybody still awake? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm awake. We're broken. Definitely. What are you broken about now? <laughs> just trying to, just trying to keep my brain going. There's so much information and my brain doesn't hold it all. Me neither. I think history from the Babylonian captivity until the church is one of the most fascinating biblical time periods. Because so much happened. God did so much. When, when you think about what he did in order for Jesus to come at the time he came. He sends this young upstart general from Macedonia, Greece, and conquered that part of the world and made everybody speak one language. Of course, that's Alexander the Great. And, and then the remnants of Alexander the Great's kingdom is overtaken by the Romans, and the Romans bring peace. The Romans bring roads. The Romans bring, bring a way to communicate and travel widely, fast. And it's into that world that Jesus comes, and the church is born, and the church is, is spread. When you think about the logistics just of those of that 600 plus years from the Babylonian captivity until the beginning of the church, when you think of those 600 years, God did so many incredible things for the church to be born that how can you not be fascinated by what God does? I think it's fascinating, but my mind also always wonders what, how did the people that were in the Americas and in far north Russia and in China and Japan. How did that all happen? Because we don't have a record of that. I think that's interesting too. You mean how they got there? Mm -hmm. They got poofed. I, I believe they got poofed. I believe the Tower of Babel, the story of the Tower of Babel in uh, Genesis 11 tells us that God moved them. If you believe in a young earth 6,000 to 10,000 years, the migration of, of animals and people that far with doesn't such work. different languages doesn't really work <laughs> apart from the supernatural work of God. So, exactly. so God confused their language for sure, but I believe he also transplanted them. My, the, the, the way the scenario plays in my mind, they went to sleep in uh, in um, um, near the Tower of Babel in northern uh, Babylon, and they woke up in uh, South Dakota. <laughs> that would be freaky. Yeah. There, there's too many things that we, that that the people of of all the continents have in common, in story, in, in uh, um, what's the right word? Stories we tell from history. 
Legend. Legend, thank you. The legends that grow up in, in these, these completely separated peoples that are so similar. The flood story is told in every culture in the world. How come? Yep. Because every culture in the world suffered from the flood. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. So, to me, that's fascinating. But the timing doesn't work. If you believe in a young earth, the timing doesn't work well unless God poofed them. And that just or fits God into my doctrine of poofology. Say that again. Or God miraculously split the earth and pangeaed them out really fast overnight. Well, that's poof. That's what, that's what the doctrine of poofology is. <laughs> You haven't been hanging around with me enough to, to have heard my full <laughs> doctrine of poofology. Uh-huh. <coughs> it's just that to me is a fascinating subject that when I get to heaven, I want to see. I want to see God do the movie reel of that. Well, I'm anxious for Ken Ham to finish uh, the uh, um, uh -huh. Tower of Babel because most of his guys have some sort of of discussion about the Tower of Babel. It's the last part of, of Scripture that most Christians don't want to accept, Genesis 1-11. to um, yeah. and, and in order to make everything work, God had to do something miraculous. That's a given. I just want to see the real movie real. In oh yeah, yeah. Fortunately, you'll have eternity to watch all the, the greatest hits of God. Think sight and sound will be providing the. <laughs> <laughs> they might. <laughs> well, I can tell you when we were at the uh, at the ark, we had the, we had a treat of listening to Ken Ham. He we we uh, sat in a lecture for an hour and a half good. with him, and and that was really good. Does was, he do that quite often? I was not aware that he did that ever, unless it was a special event. So when we got there and we saw on the schedule for today that Ken Ham was, was teaching at, I think it was at one or whatever, I just said, yeah. hey, I want to be there for that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 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 And then the next day when we were at the Creation Museum, Terry Mortensen spoke. Terry's one of his, uh, one of his leading um, scholars. And uh, I got to talk to Terry before he spoke. And uh, that was fascinating because I quoted those guys in my dissertation a bunch. Mm -hmm. I remember. I wanted to talk to Ken Ham, but he was signing autographs and then he poofed. Yeah, he got away. <laughs> yeah, he got away like right now. Yeah. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Nothing else? Yep. We lost Sandy again, didn't we? Did she go? She did. Okay. Nope. Sorry about that. Yeah, well. Quite a while ago. Yeah. Sorry. My pictures have been moving around tonight. I can't explain that. Since the latest <laughs> update to, to Zoom, things have been not quite right. <laughs> My pictures haven't moved at all. Mine either. Are you losing back. your sheep, Pastor? Am I losing my what? Sheep. Am your I sheep. losing my sheep? Yeah, from the screen today <laughs> I am, yeah. I hope not. Yeah. No. I'm losing my mind, so that, that fits. <laughs> Don't lose us. No. I won't. No. God holds me doubly accountable, so I'll do what I have to do. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.